Happy Monday, everyone. Good to have you with us. Let's get into our first interview of the morning. The World Health Organization in Africa says lockdowns should be reserved for exceptional cases when there is a danger of a severe variant, while governments put response measures in place. Giving an update on current trends of COVID-19 in Africa, Dr. Abdul Salam Uguye, who is Africa's regional emergency director from the World Health Organization, said a lockdown may be resorted to only a short-term measure, while strengthening capacity to contain the variant. Meanwhile, the South African government has recently extended the national state of disaster until the 15th of February. Now, Professor Alex van den Heerfer is a social security and health policy specialist from the Witz School of Governance, and he joins us now to talk, now to talk a little bit more. Great to have you. Thanks so much for being our guest. Uh, good morning, and to your listeners, uh, viewers. <clears throat> All right, let, let's start off with lockdowns. I mean, they always always have been and will always remain a controversial uh, conversation and issue. What are your views on what the World Health uh, Organization Africa has actually had to say? Well, I think at this stage, we've learned quite a lot about the trajectory of the virus. Um, if you will remember, sort of from March, February, March uh, 2020, a lot of countries introduced fairly draconian lockdowns as a, uh, what appeared to be a, a sort of a long-term uh, measure, a measure to, in many cases, extinguish the virus, which is not going to be possible. So what is very clear now is the virus is endemic. Um, lockdowns themselves are economically damaging, particularly in developing countries, and, um, a, and they don't really make a great deal of difference to the trajectory of the, of the virus. You can perhaps stall the sort of peak for a while, but of a particular wave, but you can't end the pandemic and you or epi local epidemic or outbreak. Um, and, uh, and at some stage, you're going to import infections from somewhere else. So lockdowns can't really be used as a prevention measure um, on a long term basis. That's the first issue. The second issue, quite simply, is that uh, we've now had several years of infection vaccination and levels of immunity will have built up in some cases at quite high cost to relevant countries like South Africa, we've had probably about 300,000 deaths. Um, but nevertheless, we have high levels of immunity, we have relatively high levels of vaccination, uh, and so probably around about 90% of the South African population has some level of Im immunity from severe illness. And under those circumstances, it, uh, it doesn't make sense to go for severe lockdowns, under, except where there's some very, very clear short-term goal. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we have a look at, at, at particularly Omicron, the way it was handled now, um, this was, I suppose, the, the, the right way to do it in terms of not having severe lockdowns. I mean, what we, what we saw during the previous waves, whether we talk about Delta, whether we talk about um, uh, Omicron or Beta, whatever it may be, whatever the case may be, the, the data was showing that this was less severe. Um, and we didn't see major lockdowns over the holiday periods. Beaches weren't closed. Alcohol wasn't stopped being sold. In fact, curfews were let go of. So, I mean, these are the kind of things that we want to see happening. But they say that during very, very severe uh, variants, that should be a scenario that a lockdown could come or could work. I know you painted a picture saying it doesn't necessarily, but perhaps it's the whole issue of hospital beds and the availability thereof. Yes, if there is a, if there is a very cl a clear need, uh, so I think that it, it, what WHO is saying, uh, certainly in relation to the current um, pandemic, is uh, don't uh, don't go overboard on lockdowns because they are really an extreme measure and are not always successful as a long uh, on a long term basis. But I think that if you've got a very very clear goal in mind, it would make sense and it might be quite localized. So uh, use them judiciously. But uh, the, I think it, Omicron is not necessarily um, less, uh, less severe. It's, we, we do have high levels of accumulated uh, um, immunity from severe infection and that from, from severe disease. And I, that is actually the important uh, issue, is that, in fact, Omicron was going to be less, uh, uh, le less impactful this time around. But it's unclear as to what the 
impact is on people who have been unvaccinated and had no prior infections. Mm. So that could still be severe for them, but we just have very, very only a very small proportion of the population that falls into that category. I want to talk about what um, the South African government, though, is doing, because, you know, there was a, a, a lot of talk around this national state of disaster and whether or not it should end. And this is the time that it uh, should be let go of because, you know, South Africa seems to be in a much better situation. As you said, you know, it looks like the pandemic has moved to endemic proportions at this point in time. However, we saw the government extending the national state of disaster by yet another month. Why? Why do something like this? Well, it's not necessarily for the restrictions. Uh, the, one of the problems is that uh, the regulations were used for both uh, the social support side as well as for the um, uh, disease prevention side. And on, that, on the uh, social support side, the regulations created allowed for a COVID SRD grant, which is being allocated to people who have no source of income, the 350 rand. They didn't use the Social Assistance Act. And they used that as an emergency measure because the, uh, there is provision, enabling provision in the Social Assistance Act for a social relief of distress allocation, but that was used for food parcels. So what they would have to do is to put the regulations into the Social Assistance Act in order to be able to close off the Disaster Management Act. So it's probably only for those reasons, tying up loose ends, that it's being extended, not because it's going to be used for curfews and lockdowns. OK, because that, that's been a, a real uh, concern for a lot of people. I mean, we've been in a state of disaster since the 15th of March 2020, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm correct in terms of the date. So we've nearly been in this state for two years. Um, so you're saying the reasons behind this are, are really to to assist and it's, it's the whole, the income, the, the, the grants that are being paid out, that's the reason for this. Nothing sinister because there are, is talk and a lot of uh, opposition parties are saying, you know, this is just their, the way of the government just uh, exercising their control on the population, which is not necessary at this time. Yeah, I don't think that that is the, the case at this point. I think that the government at this point does want to, uh, we, we can move away from the Disaster Management Act, but these loose ends have to be tied up. And uh, so I don't expect it to continue for terribly much longer. Um, I think that we are out of the period of managing this pandemic through um, uh, the Disaster Management Act. And what we will probably also see is that certain of the regulations that were used for the health interventions are going to be incorporated into the National Health Act. And therefore, you've got a sort of a more routinely available instrument. Now, so essentially, we should have uh, enabling legislation and regulations for dealing with pandemics. It doesn't have to be incorporated into a Disaster Management Act. Um, and you'd have a proper sort of framework around that legislation. So I do expect that to happen from now as well. The Department of Health hasn't been very expeditious in getting on with that because you do want to have very clear legislation so that it's only used when it's needed. But it's probably going to be the case that we will have legislation that covers this kind of thing in the conventional uh, legislative framework going forward. Mm. All right, so let's, let's look forward. I mean... I don't know what predictions are, and I hate to even bring up the, the, the topic of a fifth wave because, you know, there's just talk right now that we're getting out of the fourth wave and we, we're watching the world at the moment catching up. I mean, gosh, I, I was looking at the States. I mean, I think it was about 900,000 infections in one day was recorded in the United States last week. And, you know, this is a, a trend that's continuing. They've got a, a, a good couple of rocky weeks ahead of them, according to their health analysts. But here in South Africa, the situation is a lot better. I mean, in fact, our positivity rate is now sitting at around about 10 percent and uh, World Health Organization calling 5 percent under control. So we, we're not very far off. But looking forward, because now it's what we need to do is constantly look forward. Talk of fifth waves, talk of further lockdowns. I mean, do we know as yet? Are there any predictions in the pipeline for this? Do you know about this? Well, so I think that the general view would be that uh, uh, this is now endemic, which means that we will have multiple waves indefinitely into the future. The only difference between now and uh, March two years ago uh, was the, uh, is, is the severity of the impact of the wave. 
So the, uh, what we're seeing internationally as well as domestically is the result of extensive testing for what is now converging on a more mild disease, whereas we weren't testing, certainly those countries weren't testing extensively in some of their earlier waves. So they're picking it up, but what they're essentially doing is testing for relatively mild disease. That doesn't mean in countries like the US, you've had people who haven't been infected and who haven't been vaccinated. So there is going to be more severe illness amongst those groups. And uh, it's very it's also quite possible that in the United Kingdom and various other countries in Europe that, that there was a sort of fairly significant portion of people who were neither infected nor vaccinated. So there will be higher um, severe illness amongst those groups. But I, I think that those are the the more severe cases that we would see. Going forward, all people with comorbidities are going to be vulnerable to both flus and uh, COVID. Um, but I don't think that we're going to even be seeing the levels of testing that we have now for what will converge on a more mild disease. So the waves will be there, but we won't necessarily see them the way that we do at the moment. Mm. So, so I just want to get back to our original topic of conversation, and that is courses, lockdowns and the World Health Organization's view on all of this. So having painted the picture of what things are going to look like going forward, I mean, lockdowns have had a huge impact on livelihoods, on the economy, not, not only here, but all around the world. The economic impact has been very well documented. And, you know, we can see how bad the effects of lockdown have been. But, I mean, across the globe, and in particular in South Africa, if we look, lockdowns have, have seen a lot of human rights violations and, in some cases, death in the hands of law enforcement agencies. Now, were the strict lockdowns necessary and justifiable at the time? Uh, in my view, no, not in the South African context. Uh, the, there might be context where it could have some reasonable effect. You, you, I think that we, we had a level of restriction that was probably most effective. The, the, the framework we had in December um, 2020 is probably the framework we should, we should never have gone further than that. So I think that South Africa was largely following what China did and what some other countries also following China did, and, it, and they kind of did something similar. And it was d disastrous because we really prevent nothing. And I think that a lot of countries also thought that they, it, it didn't really uh, factor in that this is going to become endemic, that this is a long-term problem, not a short-term problem. So when you deal with it as a short-term problem, you shut down everything and it goes away after a while and then you can restart. The, the problem comes when it doesn't go away forever. And um, and so this was argued right at the beginning of our Level 5 lockdown. I certainly was part of arguing that we had to take into account a scenario where to the extent that prevention is used, it is within the context of um, uh, of an ongoing uh, epidemic, not, not a short-term one. We will never eliminate the virus. And that's um, and so I think that's the mistake made right up front. Mm -hmm. And China is still continuing with the scenario where it thinks it can go to vi you know virus elimination mm -hmm. um, until they can get vaccination levels up. But they're not going to really succeed. They will they will get infections across the border. It's impossible to to completely insulate yourself from this epidemic this pandemic. Yeah, it really is. It's something that. Uh I suppose, you know, in hindsight it is, but there are still countries, as you say, that are still enforcing some of these lockdowns and being very harsh towards uh, towards citizens. Just a, a final closing word here. I mean, we, we saw what happened with Novak Djokovic. We also have seen the messages that are, I mean, at the end of the day, as much as it is a case of, of Novak Djokovic and the Australian Open, there's a much bigger picture and lesson learned there. I mean, lockdowns may be one thing, but vaccination mandates and going forward in terms of what countries will allow and not allow. I mean, is that, is that something we are just going to have to live and accept, that vaccines are going to be mandatory if you want to move around this world or even in your own country? But I'm not sure that we will get to that extent. I think that that's being done at the moment. Uh, vaccine mandates themselves uh, might, uh, you know, end up being... Uh, an unnecessary measure if the levels... You see, people who don't get vaccinated ultimately get infected, and they're going to get infected. Everybody is going to get infected with, with COVID at some point going forward. The only question is whether you're vaccinated uh, or you, when, you, when you do or whether you've 
uh, don't have a comorbidity, so you don't get severely ill. So at some point, the levels of immunity will make this type of policy uh, ir largely irrelevant. But I think that to the extent that a country is able to manage its own um, health prevention is, is absolutely important. The rule of law is important in this respect. And I think that um, Djokovic was clearly out of order in this. And uh, to the extent that there is, he is part of, and it's not entirely clear, that he's part of a uh, sort of advertising the issue that vaccines are somehow dangerous and shouldn't be adopted, that's something you don't want to advertise. And I don't think that any government should be reinforcing that particular view. Okay. And uh, so evading um, the, the kind of framework that a country is attempting to establish. So I think a country does have to have the ability to set up its own framework to fight its diseases as it, as it sees fit. The, the, uh, until one's got an international consensus on the best way forward, um, that is the best way to move forward. Right. So I think that I think that he was in the wrong, and I and I think that what came out was correct. <clears throat> Alex, thank you very very much for talking to us. Uh, comprehensive social security and health policy specialist at the Witt School of Governance, Professor Alex Funden, here for discussing the impact of lockdowns on societies.